So, hello everyone. Good evening. So I'm um, <clears throat> in Roslyn in Scotland tonight, which is, uh, you might know that from the, the movie, The Da Vinci Code. It's uh, the end up in Roslyn Chapel at the the end of the movie. So where is, um, where is everyone else? I'm just looking for the uh, the chat box here. <laughs> so where is uh, everyone calling in from tonight? Pennsylvania. Whirl. Is that near Liverpool, Emma? New York. Seattle. Wow. Canada. Arachar, Scotland. Great. <laughs> Good to have a fellow Scot on the call. <clears throat> So I'll just get going here. The uh, so the the name of this um, masterclass webinar, whatever you want to call it, is four simple ways to instantly make peace with a troubled mind. And I'll probably I'll come in and out of the camera as we go through this, but it'll probably be mostly slides. So this is a, a quote that I like to use a lot, and it's from Abraham Lincoln, and he once said, I don't like that man. I must get to know him better. And you know, exactly the same applies to the mind. If we don't like the way the mind is, which is probably the case for most of you, or you wouldn't be on the call, the answer really is to get to know the mind better. And when you properly understand your, the relationship between yourself, thoughts, thinking, it, um, yeah, it just changes the relationship with the mind. So in this webinar, I'm going to show you a different way to relate to the mind, a way that will help you take back control of your thoughts eliminate 95% of the unwanted chatter in your head and break free from the trap of unconscious thinking. And my hope for you is that after the class, you'll see clearly that the mind doesn't have nearly as much power over you as you may have thought. That you're actually the one in charge. You know, a lot of people I talk to, they have this sense that that it's like the mind is the master and we're the slave, but it's actually the other way around when you get to know the mind better. And if you stay right until the end, pardon the cheesy image, <laughs> uh, I've got a couple of cool surprises to, to share with you. And yeah, just before we get started, yeah, it would be good if you could uh, bring your energy here and, and not be too distracted. I'm going to talk a little bit later on about all the, the various ways that we use to try and switch off the mind. And yeah, a big one these days is, is to be constantly, you know, watching TV, video games, mobiles, etc. So we could use this maybe as just a good practice for just being present in this moment for, for a little while. It should be about an hour. And I'm going to start off with a, an exercise, which I call the noticing exercise. And um, so this will be like literally three, four minutes long. It's a very short exercise. 
you know, it'll be one of the reasons I'm doing it is to there's something I'll I'll keep relating back to as we go through the presentation. So I'd like to, and I don't normally ask people to do this, but I'd like you just to bring to mind something that's troubling you in your life right now. Something that plays on your mind TV a lot. So it could be a situation, it could be a pattern in your, in your mind. Just something that occupies a lot of space in your head. And just notice how it feels in your mind, in your body. Maybe it feels a bit heavy or contracting or something. And I'm just going to go through this, this very short practice, three, four minutes, called the noticing exercise. So you might want to close your eyes for this. And I'm just going to ask you to simply notice a few things. The sensation of your body coming into contact with the chair. Just noticing how that is, how contact feels in the different parts of your body. Maybe your back is against the back of the chair. How does that feel? The feeling of your feet touching the floor. The different parts of your feet, the soles of your feet, the skin surrounding your feet. And maybe if you're really attentive, you can get a sense of tingling or pulsing inside the feet. And if not, that's fine as well. giving some attention to your breath, just noticing where in the body you can feel the breath going in. So maybe at the nostrils, maybe you can, there's a sense of the ribs expanding on the in-breath. And also noticing the out-breath the belly rising and falling. Noticing also any sounds in the room. And maybe there's no sound in the room, but no sound is also a sound. And now zooming out with your awareness and becoming aware of the whole body. The whole body sitting on the chair, breathing in, breathing out. Just experiencing how it is to, to be in this body, in this moment. Noticing that the moment is here, it's happening. Okay, so you can open your eyes again, if you had them shut. So how did you get on with that? Did you find that difficult or, or was it fairly straightforward, fairly easy? might want to just leave a word that describes your experience.
easy, relaxing. So here's the question. Still, Steve's saying, easy, Tony. Grounding, Catherine. So two questions here. What happened to your problem while you were putting your attention on your breath and on your feet and on the moment? Did you perhaps forget about it? And here's the, the key point here. You know, often people feel they need to fix things about their mind in order to experience peace. But did you need to address this problem or fix it in any way in order to experience peace right now in this moment? So this training today is um, it's really for three, three types of people I have in mind. Uh, one's people who find it very difficult to stop thinking. So maybe um, you've suffered from patterns like anxiety, fear, guilt, self-judgment, and don't know how to switch it off. Uh, maybe you've tried all the conventional ways to fix the issue without much success. Or maybe you're a, a self-help enthusiast. This was me for years and years. Looking for peace and self-acceptance through the path of working on yourself. So you're forever reading self-help books, listening to podcasts, collecting more and more techniques. But despite all your efforts, nothing much changes. Your busy mind still drives you nuts a lot of the time. And the third type is maybe you're someone who's had some kind of a spiritual awakening or a spiritual opening in the past. So an experience where you felt more expansive, more alive, more joyful, more connected than you normally do. And you'd love to get back to that space, but don't know how. So how would you, from those three, how, how would you describe yourself? And, and maybe there's even a fourth one or a fifth one that you want to use. Chronic overthinker is one. Uh, Self-help person is always reading books, two. Or someone who's had a spiritual awakening in the past. So if you want to put a number in the chat. One and two, three. Yeah, a lot of people are. Yeah. <clears throat> and the first two really go together, you know, because usually, and I mean, this was me for years and years and years. I felt the the answer to finding a solution to what I perceived to be my, my broken mind was to try and fix it. And I'll, I'll come to that shortly. So why would you want to listen to me? That's the next, next part. That's me in India at a mountain called Arunachala, where I've been going for the past 20 years every year. So I've spent the last four decades or so on a journey of spiritual exploration and self-discovery. I was a monk for seven years. I spent 25 years teaching meditation. Well, and I still do. And more years than I can remember sitting cross-legged on dirt floors at the feet of Indian masters, Indian ashrams. And I've written three books and I'm a, also a qualified mindfulness teacher. <laughs> But the main reason I do what I do is that I see so many people suffering unnecessarily. And I know I can help. So it's like, you know, when you have this knowledge, you, you just naturally want to share it. 
I remember when I came out of my, you know, when I was a novice monk and I was sitting on an airplane, just having come out of a six month retreat. <laughs> and I wanted to stand up on this airplane full of people and shout, you're not your mind. <laughs> and I very quickly discovered that people aren't, <laughs> you know, not everyone's interested to know that. But over the years, I've discovered a few simple but profound truths about the nature of the mind and our relationship with it. Truths that can help anyone experience way more peace and inner freedom in no time at all. Immediately, in fact, you know, peace is now is the only time we can experience peace. And it, I guess it's my passion and, and I also see it as a kind of purpose to share what I've learned and help people find the peace they're looking for. And there's one particular insight I want to share. You could call it a master insight that changed everything for me in an instant. And it's a completely different way of relating to the mind. You know, if you think back to this um, quote, I don't like that man, I must get to know him better. And this one insight alone can cut years and years off your search for peace and fulfillment. It can allow anyone to experience peace right now, no matter how busy or troubled the mind may be. And maybe you even got a little hint of that during the, the noticing exercise that we just did. Hint, the mind is not the problem. So, where we're going over the next hour, well, 50 minutes now. So I'm going to just do a quick uh, talk about the human condition and what the issue is. And then I'm going to talk about four ways to instantly make peace like in this moment and regardless of what's going on in the mind. This was quite a challenge for me to pick four things. <laughs> um, but these are the ones I've picked. The, the difference between peace of mind and peace with mind. I'll just go through them quickly here because I'm going to talk about each one in a moment. The difference between thoughts and thinking. That's a game changer. Questioning everything the mind tells you. I always say the mind's like, it tells more lies than Pinocchio. And then this concept of second arrow which is probably the cause of at least 90% of the unwanted traffic in our heads comes from this. And then I'm going to share with you an opportunity to work with me closely. And we're going to end with live Q&As. So if you have questions coming up as I go through this presentation, just put them in the chat box and... Um, and I'll address them at the end. Sound good? So I'll just jump straight in. The issue, lost in thinking, the human condition. The moment we wake up in the morning, or most people, the, it's like what I call the mind TV is just off and running broadcasting all its favorite programs, you know, and the programs will differ from person to person. And I remember, you know, I used to sit, for example, I'd be sitting having breakfast. And in my mind, I, I was lost in my to-do list for the day. I'd be thinking about, oh, I have to go to the bank, have to go to the post office. Um. Or, you know, it could have been dwelling on some issue in the mind, anxiety, unworthiness, something like that. But at some point, I would look down and there would be an empty bowl of cornflakes in front of me. <laughs> and I had absolutely no recollection of eating it. Never mind the songbird that was singing outside the window the whole time, or the sun streaming in the window. I was... I just wasn't there. And then I would be 
you know, driving to work. And again, it was like my body was driving to work. I wasn't there. I was lost in a conversation I'd had, you know, with a, a friend a couple of days before, or I'd be thinking about, you know, something I had to do at work. The next thing I knew, I'd be pulling into the, you know, the car park, and I had no recollection whatsoever of having driven there. So can you guys, can you relate to this? Just give me a yes if you can relate to what I'm talking about. <clears throat> yeah, so everyone knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> and here's the thing, is that this tends to happen unconsciously. We're not... I have a good friend of mine, Sandy Newbigging. He was he was also a, a fellow monk and author, and he he's got a book called Funk. And he said, if you don't know how to switch the mind off at will, you're not thinking; you're being thunk. And that's how we go through our days, being thunk. And there's two main consequences to being getting caught up in this kind of unconscious thunking. One of them is like when the content's predominantly negative and we don't know how to stop it, we don't know how to switch the mind off, it can be really overwhelming and cause a lot of suffering. And the other consequence is that living in our heads, we miss out on the fullness of life in the present moment. So I sometimes tell a story about being in the park with my daughter and she was three, three years old. And like all three year olds, she was just completely absorbed in her own little world. You know, the bug crawling up the blade of grass, the airplane flying overhead. And at one point she screamed, oof, oof, which was her baby word for dog. And I was just snapped out of this dream that I'd been in. And it's like I noticed for the first time that I was in the park, that we'd even arrived in the park. You know, up until then, I'd just been lost in this unconscious thinking. So who do you think was having a, a richer, more vibrant, more alive experience of the park? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was her. So what do we do about this, you know, this never ending stream of thunking that's going on? There's four main strategies that people use. First one, and probably the first two or three are probably what the vast majority of people use, suppression. So, you know, things like reaching for the cookie jar, opening the fridge, um, drinking, smoking, distraction. So mobile phones, video games, watching TV, different forms of entertainment. You know, so basically anything to distract you from this, this continuous stream of thoughts that's moving through the head. Another one is busyness. You know, some people, they, they just can't sit still for a minute. So they have to just keep stay busy all the time as a means of distracting themselves. And then, uh, you know, there may be other ones as well that, that I haven't put there. I think in the last training I did, somebody said exercise, which was, was a very good one. And then the fourth one is self-improvement. And this is one that I did for years and years and years, and I'm sure that probably most people on this call have, have dabbled with self-improvement. And the thing is, and I don't know if you'll probably agree with this, for a long time, I thought there was something wrong with my mind. I thought it was broken. I believed that anxious thoughts shouldn't be there. I believed that it was wrong to feel sad or confused. 
You know, I believe that I should be happy. I should be peaceful. I believe that I couldn't be happy until these patterns were sorted and to, until I'd uh, fixed them. And it's just logical that if you think something's broken, the obvious solution is to try and fix it. <clears throat> so can you relate to this one? How many of you would agree with these statements that anxious thoughts shouldn't be there? It's wrong to feel sad or confused. These are universal. I think, in fact, you need to be a bit crazy to even <laughs> suggest that these may not be true <laughs> because there's so, there's a statement from Anthony DeMello and he says that the, the, the main cause of unhappiness is the false beliefs that we adhere to, beliefs that are so common, so widely believed that nobody even thinks to question them. You know, who would even question that it's wrong to feel sad or confused? And yet, I would say it's just part of the, the natural flow of the human mind. It's not bad or, you know, it's like if it's raining outside. You, you know, you may prefer that it was sunny, but you wouldn't say that it's bad, that the rain's bad or that the rain's wrong. So I spent years working on myself trying to find peace of mind through upgrading my turbulent thoughts, feelings, and emotions, trying to turn them into peaceful ones. Maybe you can relate. So now I call this trying to iron the ocean <laughs> because these, these thoughts are just a natural part of the human condition. You're going to have pleasant thoughts. You're going to have unpleasant. And here's the main problem with the self, you know, with trying to find peace of mind. This is a teacher, Nisargadatta. He said, there's no such thing as peace of mind. Mind itself is disturbance, restlessness. So restlessness is the nature of mind, which is why I say it's like trying to iron the ocean, trying to find peace of mind. And you could literally literally spend 30 years, 40 years doing this. And I'm not saying that you won't make some um, progress um, and you will experience moments of peace, but it's always going to be, you know, if you're looking for peace as an experience, as a feeling, then any experience has a beginning and an end. It, it's inevitable that it's going to leave again. And so it's never something you can hold on to. There's another piece I'm going to talk about later, which is the piece that, at the core of our being, which doesn't move. So some other reasons why self-improvement, I don't believe is the most effective approach. You have no control over the thoughts. Dark clouds are a perfectly natural part of the human condition. You know, if you completely accept your sadness, your anxiety, what's the problem? And here's the main one. You're looking for peace in the future. Not right now. So it's like you're hoping, hoping that, you know, things will change in order for you to experience peace. And what I want to suggest in this talk, you know, is that you don't need to change anything. So the day my life changed, <clears throat> I was on a six-month meditation retreat. And I, I had an experience, an awakening, I guess you could call it, where I felt the most extraordinary joy and peace, like nothing I'd ever experienced before. And it continued for two months, whether I meditated or not. I actually got banned from the meditation hall because <laughs> I couldn't stop laughing. But the amazing thing was that my mind hadn't changed in the slightest. All the anxious thoughts, the unworthy thoughts that had brought me to the retreat in the first place were still there. All the unresolved issues were still in place. On the surface, I was still a mess, just like before, nothing had changed. And yet I was filled with this deep peace. 
And this is the key line here, a peace that had nothing to do with the mind. You know, there's two kinds of peace. There's peace which comes and goes as a feeling, as an emotion. And then there's the peace of your, of your true nature, I'll call it. One is fleeting, the other one is unchanging and permanent. So three things I discovered through this experience. One, you don't have to change a single thing about the mind to experience the peace you're looking for. You'll never find ongoing peace in the mind because the mind is restless by nature. You will find moments of peace, of course, just like you will find moments of agitation. And the third one, there's a deep, unchanging place inside you that has absolutely nothing to do with what's going on in the mind. It's your true nature. So does this... Is this making sense? Are you following me here? <clears throat> so I'm going to jump now into the um, four ways to instantly make peace with a troubled mind. I'll pop on the camera just for a moment, <laughs> just so you can see me. It's funny because my original title for the webinar was 14 ways to make peace with a troubled mind. But I think that would have been a like an eight hour class. So I needed to cut it back to four. So these are the four which I felt could, you know, be of the most benefit to you. The, the, the most simple things you can apply straight away. So the reason I put this light bulb here is because for me, this was a massive light bulb moment and it's understanding the difference between peace of mind and peace with mind. And this one, you might want to take a screenshot and print it and put it on your wall. Because <laughs> I think this, for me, this is the essence. You don't suffer because the mind is restless, anxious, sad, confused, whatever your own particular issue is. You suffer because you believe it shouldn't be. Does that make sense? You suffer because you believe the mind should be peaceful or there's something wrong. What if, rather than spending years trying to iron the ocean to find some fleeting moments of peace, you focused instead on making peace with the fact that the mind is restless, crazy, messed up, all over the place. I'm not talking about you guys here. This is how my mind was. Making peace with your lack of peace. So you can always wrap peace around anything, including agitation, anxiety, through making peace with the fact that it's there in your experience. So what if, and Christian's saying, yeah, but the feelings, emotions are really strong. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. What if you fully expected the mind to be restless, confused, grumpy, impatient, whatever your own particular flavor is? It's called the human condition. What if you didn't see any of it as bad or wrong? What if you didn't feel the need to heal, fix, or change any of it in order to be at peace? I mean, these are pretty radical, huh? What if you weren't waiting for things to improve in your life before you could start enjoying yourself? 
This is one that comes up a lot when I have coaching clients. People are waiting. It's like they're waiting for years and years and years for for a particular cloud to pass before they can get back into enjoying their life, you know. And and I just try to show them now that you know the piece you're looking for is right there, whether the cloud is there or not. And, you know, I'm talking about this piece that has nothing to do with the mind. What if you were able to be completely at peace with the mind, just as it is? And I'm not suggesting that these are things that you can just, you know, switch off in a second. I mean, they do, you know, obviously take a little bit of um, <clears throat> working on. But, you know, you might see it as a general direction. You're going to experience peace a lot quicker <laughs> rather than try to change and fix the mind itself you know changing the restlessness the confusion the grumpiness the impatience could take you 30 years 40 years making peace with the fact that it's there could could be a lot quicker So in truth, we don't suffer because we have negative thoughts or emotions. We suffer because we believe there's something wrong. We believe they shouldn't be there. We believe there's something wrong with us for having them. We believe they need to be gone for us to experience peace. And we suffer because we give them a huge amount of our attention. How many of you, you know, when you're spinning out on, on some, you know, difficult situation in your mind, how, how many of you give it a lot of your attention? It's like your attention keeps going there over and over and over. So you keep feeding it. <clears throat> so this is a quote from my book, Kick the Thinking Habit. Don't be concerned about the thoughts that come and go. Leave them alone, and they will leave you alone. Leave the mind in peace to do its dance, and it will leave you in peace to do yours. <clears throat> Don't touch it at all, and you'll remain untouched by it. And you can get this book for free through my website, Think less and grow rich dot com so let's move on to the second one strategy number two yep mike's saying yeah you can't help being drawn to them yeah it's a habit of a lifetime mike it's you know i sometimes talk about going to the gym that we, the, the muscle of following the thoughts and getting caught up in the thoughts is just really strongly developed because we've been doing it all of our lives. And to train the other muscle, which is to not follow thoughts, take, take some training. So the next one, the difference between thoughts and thinking. Ready for another game changer? Thoughts are self-arising. They appear by themselves and they're not in our control. Thinking, on the other hand, is a choice. You can choose to stop thinking in any moment. You know, like in the when we did the noticing exercise, <clears throat> you know, I asked you to begin by thinking about an issue or a problem. And then I asked you to put your attention on your feet, on your hands, on your, you know, the physical sensations of the body. And you can't stop thoughts from appearing in your head. They will appear by themselves. But thinking's a choice. So when you're being thunk, Particularly when the mind's storylines are negative, it can feel as if thinking is something that's happening to you. Like you're an innocent victim being subjected to a tsunami of thoughts against your will. And you don't have any choice but to listen. 
Can you relate to that? That was my experience for a long time. I thought that I was just, my mind was just crazy and, and I had no choice at all. I, I just had to listen to this crazy mind going on all day. And I, I didn't see any way out of that. The only way out I saw was the, to try and fix the mind and to make the mind itself more pleasant. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, you can spend years trying to do that. So everyone's agreeing with us. Yeah. You feel like an innocent victim being subjected to against your will to, to this. <clears throat> you feel like taking a, a hammer to it, Amelia. You know, the thing though with the mind is that the, the more you reject it, the, the more power you give it it's actually the the opposite um you know will have more of an effect withdrawing your attention from it so when we did the noticing exercise was it possible to choose to put your attention on your breath or on your feet rather than following the storylines in your head i think you've already said yeah that's possible <clears throat> so thinking is a choice So it's not true that thinking is something that happens to you. It just seems that way. Although thoughts are self-arising, you are in charge of where you choose to put your attention. Whether you choose to follow thoughts and make stories out of them or not. Your attention is your secret weapon. It is kryptonite to the mind. Without your participation, the mind has no power to affect your peace. You're the one in control. So this is pretty much exactly the opposite of how it feels here. Yeah? <clears throat> but it's really, it's true that you're the one in control. When you start, when you get to know the mind better, like I said at the beginning, and you start to see that you know, it really only has, the only reason it has so much power is because we're in, we have such a strong habit of energizing it all the time, giving it power. So the third strategy, the mind tells more lies than Pinocchio. It's funny, I think I said in my book that I would trust a politician before I would trust the rubbish that comes out of my own head. And I'm not sure if I believe that anymore, <laughs> with the current batch of politicians that we have. The mind's take on reality is unreliable, to put it mildly. So most of us had a head riddled with false beliefs and self-critical thoughts echoes of what we took on board as children don't know about you but these were some of the things i heard a lot when i was a kid you're a bad boy you're not good enough you're a disappointment you're never gonna amount to anything and of course as a five-year-old you drink all this stuff in you you know <clears throat> you don't realize that you know maybe your parents have got issues of their own and that they're projecting onto you. And then 20, 30 years later, you're walking around in a grown up body with your five year old programming still very much alive in your head. And there's certain universal beliefs that um, <clears throat> when I talk about the course that, that I've created later, this is something I talk about quite a lot is these universal beliefs. One of them is the belief that there's something wrong with me. Um, and yeah, it's actually inevitable that we came to these conclusions as children. So my advice, I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember Inspector Columbo. He was a 70s TV detective. Question every thought. If your mind tells you 
that you'll never amount to anything. Think of all the things you've successfully achieved. <clears throat> Build a compelling case to support the opposite. It can be really good to, to get pen and paper and do this. You know, if you feel like you're unlovable, sit and write a list of any, everyone who's ever complimented you or told you you're great. You quickly discover that most of your long held beliefs will crumble very easily. Take everything the mind tells you with a large pinch of salt. I've spent most of my life worrying about all the things that never happened. Mark Twain. <clears throat> and here's this. Uh, the first question in particular is a really good one. I've used this one a lot in the past. Do I know for 100% certain that this is true? How do I feel when I believe this thought and when I don't? And, you know, this is just part of the kind of general shift of becoming more conscious. When we're being thunk, it tends to happen on autopilot and there's not a lot of un there's not a lot of consciousness there. It's happening by itself. And as you develop the ability to step back and become the observer of the mind, you can start to see all these patterns, these beliefs, these assumptions. So before you assume that the twinge in your chest is an impending medical emergency, or imagine you're going to get fired, lose your house, end up sleeping in the gutter just because your boss looked at you in a strange way. Consider this. You've no idea what may or may not happen in future. <clears throat> How many of you have that tendency to, your mind will always go to the worst possible scenario, the worst outcome? That's just a habit. So I'm going to jump now into the fourth one and <clears throat> second arrow. And this is huge. This is responsible for probably 90% of the traffic in your head. And what it is, is your unconscious reaction to things that happen in your life. Deepak Chopra <clears throat> said, most people live their entire lives in bondage, a bundle of nerves and conditioned responses, which are constantly being triggered by other people and circumstances into totally predictable outcomes. We react to everything in our world. <clears throat> so second arrow comes from our unconscious reactions to thoughts, feelings, circumstances that are not in our control. Here's a couple of examples. First arrow, you're in a queue and somebody skips in front of you. First arrow is not in our control, yeah? Before you know it, your blood pressure is going through the roof. You get angry, you start saying, I can't believe it. Some people are just so rude. The world has gone crazy. People just don't have any manners anymore. And you know, often a lot of people will carry this stuff around with them all day. A lot of people will carry it around <laughs> with them for a lifetime. And it's not, you know, the it's the this unconscious reaction to everything that's going on in our world. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, situations, other people. Another example, first arrow, you're feeling sad, anxious, confused, which again is self-arising. It's not something that you consciously create or choose, it just happens. Second arrow, this is bad. <clears throat> I shouldn't be feeling this way. There's something wrong with me. I'll never be happy ever again. I can't live like this anymore. 
And this, when I say that 90% of the unwanted thoughts in our head comes from second arrow, this is what I mean. That we're going around reacting to everything that's coming up in our day, whether it be inner weather or outer weather. And most of the thoughts are, are to do with this, or are, are, are commentary, if you like, on what's going on. Does that make sense? I'm guessing everyone's still there. <laughs> so autopilot reaction versus conscious response. So a more conscious response might be something like, hmm, anxiety doesn't feel great, but that's okay. Nothing wrong happening. And since that's what's there anyway in this moment, I haven't chosen it, but that's what's there. You know, I'm going to choose to flow with it rather than resist it and create more suffering. I mean, this, uh, you know, maybe in my, my own personal reaction would be there would be no reaction. <laughs> I would just see it and that would be it. But just to give an example, yeah, <clears throat> all suffering comes from resistance to what is. You will experience peace to the extent that you allow whatever arises in your experience to be there. <clears throat> and this is a really important one. Most people confuse peace with peace feeling good. Who would agree with that? When you think of the word peace, do you think of good feelings? I'm going to wait for, to see what you put here. Yeah, yeah. How about if it was possible to be sad and to be at peace? to be anxious and to be at peace, to be confused and to be at peace. You know, you're just recognizing that, okay, that's what the moment's presenting and I have a choice. I can resist it or I can, I can allow it. And this, I mean, obviously a lot of these I could go a lot deeper into. <clears throat> so, yeah, people are agreeing there. That's a good one to get, you know, that you can, you don't have to be feeling good to be at peace. Mm. Bring that one up again, Christian, at the end, we can discuss that if, if you would like. The difference between pain and suffering. So there you are, four simple ways to instantly make peace with a troubled mind. Actually, five if you include the noticing exercise. Noticing exercise, choosing to put your attention on the present moment will instantly stop thinking in its tracks. Peace of mind versus peace with mind. You know, recognizing that the mind is restless by nature and that it's like trying to iron the ocean, tr you know, trying to, in fact, it's impossible to, you know, to try and arrange the mind in a way that you only get peaceful, pleasant thoughts. It's just not the, the nature of the mind. But what you can do instead is to make peace with the fact that the mind is restless Understanding the difference between thoughts and thinking. Thoughts are self-arising. You know, thoughts are like the guy who jumps the queue. It's not... The thoughts that appear in your head are not any more created by you than, than someone who jumps a queue. Thinking, which is a choice. When you're conscious. Uh, questioning your beliefs and false assumptions. <clears throat> and then second arrow, which is our reactive 
our reactions to, to what happens inside us and outside of us. That's, I would love to have more time, actually, to go into a few of these topics in detail, particularly the one about pain and suffering, because that's, that's a very interesting distinction. But I'm going to keep going with the talk right now. So, having heard what you've heard, can you see yourself using some of these strategies? <clears throat> To bring peace into your life right now, not years from now when you've managed to resolve all your issues, but right now, just as you are. Now is the only time peace can be experienced. And maybe you can see from what I've been sharing that just how close, how immediate, how attainable the peace, the joy, the inner freedom you long to experience is. I've, to be honest, and this talk just now has been very mind-based, you know, in terms of, you know, I've been offering solutions for the mind. What I do when I teach is that there's a lot more diving inside into that ocean of peace that's inside us. And, uh, you know, obviously you can't do that in a talk or yeah, <laughs> it wouldn't really work to do a half hour meditation, but it's something I normally incorporate a lot into the teaching is the, um, you know, connecting directly with the peace inside. So you literally don't have to fix anything about yourself to experience peace, only your relationship with thoughts. And it's not even that difficult to achieve when you know how. A lot of people are have lost, it's like losing the keys, losing your car keys in the garden and looking for them in the house. It's like you could look there forever and, and not find them. So you, you need to know where to look. So I want to tell you about this... Um, course that I've just put together and you know feel very free to leave at this point if this is not something that interests you the uh you really I wanted to offer this teaching um so after more than 20 years of running meditation retreats coaching programs writing books uh, hanging out in ashrams I've finally, and this is something I've just wanted to do for a long time, I've put everything I've learned into what I believe is a unique and comprehensive program designed to just walk anyone from a place of struggle and inner conflict to finding this deep sense of peace, joy and aliveness at the core of who we are. So I'm not talking about the peace of, you know, changing the mind, I'm talking about the peace of, that's always there. And a couple of, uh, I've, I've done a pilot version of this course, so I have a, a couple of testimonials from other people that have gone through this. This woman, Dawn, she'd been in therapy for years and she, she did the course and within the first couple of weeks she found herself able to stop the constant ruminating. Her anxiety was way less. And as she worked through more and more of the modules, she continued to learn how becoming the observer of the mind instead of letting it control me. She got more than she was expecting. Or Anne, this has been a life changer for me. And I have many of these. And they're not really so important. I think you'll you'll get a sense within yourself of whether this is something that's attractive to you or not. <clears throat> the thing with these this way of working is that I mean I'm and I'm not saying this at all to blow my trumpet or to say I'm great, but I regularly get people who have been experiencing you say anxiety, for example, for 20 years, 30 years, and within one session, they're saying, 
they've never experienced so much peace ever. And it's simply because peace is the nature. They've, they've been looking for peace of mind. And, and what I show them is how to make peace with the mind and to dive deeply in, into the peace of their nature. And that, the peace of your true nature, is not, it's got nothing to do with what's going on in the mind. So here's the question. Would you like me to virtually hold your hand and walk you step by step through a simple process to disentangle yourself from the clutches of a busy mind and find the peace, joy, and sense of inner freedom that's there inside you right now, waiting to be discovered? You know, to be honest, it's your heart that will answer that question, not your head. So you could take what you've learned today, which in all truth, if you apply this, even just what we've gone through today, it can make a massive difference to your experience of peace right now. Even if you were to take one of those four, you know, like um, second arrow, for example, or making peace with the mind. Um <clears throat> It can make a huge difference to your life. But what I've discovered, and I've discovered this for myself as well, is that when I'm in isolation and I'm away from the energy of a group and the support, that it's a lot harder. It's a lot harder to do this stuff on your own than it is within a group. And you probably, even if you got some, you know, relief in, in the short term, you probably end up back where you are before long. The other option, let me guide you step by step through a simple, well laid out process to cut out the mind's incessant chatter and to wake up to who you really are. I mean, that, that's what's on offer here. <laughs> Not just peace, but aliveness, vibrancy, connection, playfulness, humor. You know, you probably all have a sense of that in there somewhere inside you, there's this person that, that you know, you know that you could be, <laughs> but, but you don't know how to, you don't know how to reach them. And that's what's on offer. And there'll be a ton of help, support, and guidance along the way. So if you're ready to change your relationship with the mind forever, to experience more peace, joy, and aliveness than you thought possible, and you know, I thought of taking that out, but I, I consciously decided to leave that in. Because this is a common experience when people... I have a couple of really powerful meditations which will just take you straight into that space of who you are. And people commonly say that, that they didn't even know that this peace was possible, this level of peace. So I'm not talking about, you know, the peace of mind, but peace with. So I'd like to enjoy you to... I'd like to invite you to join me inside, switch off your mind, light up your life. So it's all about getting to know yourself and the mind better. You learn how to <clears throat> relate to your thoughts in a completely different way a way that will help you effortlessly break free from the trap of unconscious thinking. Cut out 95% of the noise in your head. And when the mind is quiet enough to directly experience the simple and natural presence, which is at the core of your being. And this is what everyone's looking for, whether, whether they know it or not. We all ultimately we want to come home. And until we find that place inside ourselves, there's always going to be this, um, this sense of searching, this sense of looking, this sense of not having arrived, which 
is felt as a kind of inner restlessness. So this is what you'll get in the course, seven modules, 34, I've really put everything into this course, seven plus hours of video instruction, two powerful frameworks, including my entire seven steps to inner freedom coaching program, 14 guided meditations, leading you to a direct experience of deep peace at the core of your being. And then and I think this is the most valuable part. I'm going to be twice a week. I'm going to come on live for an hour and a half. So one session will be the modules will be dripped. One, you know, one module will come out at the beginning of the week. And then there will be a live recap of the module. And then later in the week, also a Q&A. So you're going to, you'll have a lot of access to me and, and a lot of live teachings. And also the support of uh, of the community as well. And these are the seven modules. Lost in thinking, the human condition. Be here now, how breaking out of autopilot is really the key. You know, just becoming more conscious of being thunk. Seven steps to inner freedom. Seven ways to disentangle yourself from the mind. Four, resistance is the root of all suffering. <clears throat> Leaving the mind in peace is the key to inner freedom. Thoughts, thinking, and storylines. Seeing this alone, clear seeing alone will set you free. Unconditional self-acceptance. So I talk a lot about the two selves as well which I probably mentioned in Kick the Thinking Habit, Tony. <laughs> I actually have another book called Awaken the Happy You, and I know I talk a lot about the two selves in there. The conditioned self, which is the, you know, the, the name, the form, the, the nationality, the job, the, the identity, and the unconditional, which is your, your pure essence. And that, that's the topic of the seventh, uh, seventh module. <clears throat> and the value for this, you know, I've, I've watched these webinars before where people say, you know, module one worth $18,000 and two is 24, priceless. <laughs> I'm just going to say one word. It's really priceless. And a couple of bonuses as well. I'm going to throw in my, my book, which I just recently wrote called Help, I Can't Stop Thinking. This is uh, chronicling my interactions with my own teacher as a novice monk and the many words of wisdom he shared with me. So this book's packed full of gold nuggets. And here's a breakdown again of what you'll get. The videos, live teaching, Facebook group. And in the Facebook group, I'll pop in there daily. And also all the recordings of the classes will be in the Facebook group too. So you can, you know, if you can't make the, <clears throat> the live teachings, you can always um, catch them later. You can uh, have you know, continuous email support from me. You can ask questions at any point. In fact, I mean, I'm very free with my time. I just, all the time, I jump on Zoom calls with people and stuff. And PDF and audiobook versions of help, I can't stop thinking. And as a second bonus, I got nine more guided meditations, which supplement the book help i can't stop thinking and tony one of these days i'm going to get around to putting these books on amazon <laughs> i always i find it right i find it easier to just keep writing more books than to figure out how to put them up uh this one i'll skip so the cost 
And it almost seems strange for me to put a price on the inner freedom. I come very much from the Indian tradition, you know, where everything's given freely. But also in India, it's, you know, the gurus looked after by the people, so they don't have to charge anything. But based on what other people are charging for similar offers, and considering my experience, I think I consider myself fairly experienced, yeah. My background as a monk, all the years of living in Indian ashrams, running meditation retreats, writing books, I could probably ask for at least 1,500 or even more. And I think that would still be totally reasonable. But today, you can get started for $245 dollars. So this is a install, three installments. The full price is 675, but you can also pay it in three installments of 245. But I will definitely, you know, this is literally the, the second one that I've, time I've run this course. So I've deliberately set the cost really low. Um, so it will, you know, almost definitely go up in future and i've put you know grab it before i come to my senses because <laughs> they're really uh... oh, hang on <laughs> one moment i'm trying to sort the tech i'm trying to come back on camera here so you can go now to uh this um link richardpatterson.com and that'll take you straight to the, the sales page if you, if you want to just jump in. So these are the, the payment options in full. And the next course is going to be starting on Monday, the 3rd of October. And so the first module will come out on that day. So self-study option. So you can also just take get the seven modules themselves, you know, the video um, instruction modules. You get all the bonuses as well. And this is just without the live teaching. So that's 297 or the full eight week package, which is 675 or three payments of 245. And there's the you know, the URL again. And yeah, I don't think I need to go through all of this again. But it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. This really is everything you need to, um, to really break free of the mind. You know, assuming you put in the work, of course. I mean, I, I can't do that for you, but, but I can definitely show you clearly the path to follow if that's your desire. So how much is freedom worth to you? You know, a better question is how much does, would it cost not to become free? You know, to stay as you are. Imagine if you were in control of the mind and could switch it on and off. If you were much more present in your life, alive, fully engaged, more kind, loving and compassionate towards yourself. And this is the big one for me, able to find deep rest in the depths of your being and come home to yourself you know it's really it's the end of the searching and there's a guarantee as well so basically if you do the first two weeks of the course and for whatever reason you feel that it's not for you you, you get a refund no questions asked. So all of this, if you go to the sales page, it's all written there on the sales page. And finally, for the first seven people who sign up, I'm throwing in a free one-on-one -on -one coaching session. If 
you sign up before the end of September. <clears throat> so, hope to see you inside the course. So that's the end of the um, <clears throat> presentation. So if you have um, any questions, I'd be very happy to stay on for a little while and, and answer them. <clears throat> Do we have any? Amelia, are you still there? Oh, you're very welcome, Kenny. Where where are you calling from? Or not calling, but where are you? I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you were asked, ah, Kenny, you're in Arachar. Where is it, Arachar? I'm not sure exactly where it is. Sounds like it's in the Highlands somewhere. So you're asking Amelia whether this is a Zen understanding. Is that the question? It's really, you know, what I'm sharing is... Um, I would call it more of a, a universal teaching. You know, I've been in, well, 40 years, I've looked into many traditions. And you'll find if you go into the mystical tradition of, you know, whether it's Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Sufism, that they're actually all talking about the same thing. Non-duality, I, I, that was my background for many years. I studied with Ramana Maharshi. I don't know if you know him. <clears throat> so any more questions? Rob. It's like our style of life and the constant feed of catastrophic media is all set up to hook the mind and all its falsehoods. Yeah, I mean, now more than ever is a good time to discover that place inside yourself that doesn't move. Because, you know, although the world's constantly shifting, there, there's, a, there's a, an unmoving part of your being. So what, uh, do you have a question, Christian? So you love Ramana Maharshi, Amelia. Yeah, me too. I've been going to his ashram for many, many years. In fact, I'm going there in December. I'll be running this course for eight weeks and then I'll be going to Ramana Maharshi Ashram. Do you need to constantly keep reminding yourself about the mind and how it operates to become free of it? The first step, Kenny, is to break out of this automatic mode, you know, where we're being funk. So to notice that you can step back and be the observer of the thinking. And in the beginning, it does require some um, perseverance and some discipline. It's like you'll keep slipping back again and again and again into the old habit of following the mind and got, get caught up in thoughts. 
but it's very much like, like I said earlier, it's like training a, a muscle, a new muscle. And you get better and better at it with practice. So it can seem in the beginning a bit like work. <laughs> so easy to forget everything you just talked about especially when the mind is so active yeah don't energize it Mike yeah totally get you Kenny <clears throat> that's just the mic that's the mind talking mic I wouldn't listen to it the mind's telling you that it's so easy to forget everything but the only issue is believing the mind and listening to it maybe it's uh, what the mind's telling you is not true <clears throat> so does anyone else have any questions good question Rob <clears throat> I would say that the thoughts come first and the feelings and emotions are a, um, a result of the thought. But the time between the arising of the thought and the arising of the, of the emotion is so, so small that it seems as if the whole thing is just one action. And some teachings say that uh, emotions, feelings and emotions are thoughts. They're just a different form of thought. <clears throat> what about when you don't hear the mind talking? Instead, it's physical feelings and emotions. Your mind probably is talking, Kenny. It's just uh, not being recognized. You, you're not seeing it as thoughts. So if there are no more questions I'll, I'll wrap it up here and feel free to email me anytime my email is richard at think less and grow rich with any more questions and I'll be very happy to answer them mm, Mike let's talk about that one <laughs> Yeah. The eye that finds itself arguing with the mind, is that not just the mind as well? What you're calling I is, I would say, is the mind. The mind is arguing with the mind. The mind is trying to challenge the mind. The two aspects of the mind, one of them impersonating as you Rob absolutely remembering to be the observer and the observer is always at peace the observer is not um, you know it's very much like the sky with clouds floating across it it's not touched by the different types of clouds that come 
Mike, there's probably at least 10 in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. In all of us. In all of us. Yeah. Okay. So thank you all for coming along tonight. And I hope you I hope you got something out of that. And if you do feel like joining me on the course, that would be absolutely wonderful. I'd, I'd love to work with you for a few weeks and really help you shift the, the relationship with the mind. You're very welcome, Christian. Welcome, Rob. Welcome, Kerry. Vinay. Are you from India, Vinay? Okay. Ah, Toronto. Okay. Okay. So thank you for coming and hopefully talk to some of you again soon. Bye.